Okay, so uh, just to catch up as where we are here, uh, we're talking about uh, the parameters for the force damped oscillator equation that I derived this morning, today, uh, and then Wednesday we're going to complicate that further by extending it to an infinite number of possible ones at the same time with Fourier series. Uh, and then there's no class Friday. I'm out of town giving a talk at Oklahoma State University. Uh, they invited me out for a seminar, so I'm going to be doing that on Friday, so you guys are out. You guys are off. Uh, and then next week, we start into the weird stuff. The stuff you have not seen before. The stuff that you will quickly wish you had never seen. But that uh, is pretty esoteric, but also cool. I think it's cool. Um, but that's, it's going to take us a while to build up to the usefulness. But that's next week. Uh, in the meantime, let's start with uh, the equation I derived this morning. For a force damped oscillator, the equation of motion is, position is a function of time, A cosine we get t minus delta, right? And these are the long-term solution amplitude and phase, and the forced frequency, but also the transient term. And I showed you guys this morning that that amplitude, the long-term amplitude, is equal to forcing amplitude divided by square root omega naught squared minus omega squared plus four beta squared, omega squared, very great. And that the forcing phase is two beta omega over omega naught squared minus omega squared. Uh, all that. Inverse tangent, okay. So that's what we derived this morning, and I told you I put off discussing it. Whenever I derive the equation, I actually really like to like really think about what that means. And I want to do that so hard, I want to think so hard, oh, it's going to hurt. We're going to think all the next hour about what these two equations mean, basically. Um, so let's get started. First of all, the amplitude of the long-term solution is proportional to the forcing, the amplitude of the forcing acceleration. Right? Remember that's F divided by M. So that makes sense, right? You force the thing ten times harder, the final amplitude will be proportionally ten times greater. Okay, that's the easy part. On the bottom is a relatively nasty function of the natural forcing, the natural frequency, or what it would frequency, what the frequency would be if you know, you weren't forcing it. And the forcing frequency, which is omega, it's also somewhat related to the friction beta. So let's look at what that looks like. Okay. The plot out here, the amplitude, the forced amplitude as a function of, um, this looks the same if you do it the other way. I don't like how I've done it here. Um, of forcing frequency. So let's imagine you have some oscillator with some natural frequency omega naught, and you're going to force it at a bunch of different frequencies. Okay. When you force it at very low frequencies, okay. So omega here is relatively large. Well, the difference between omega and omega naught starts off fairly large. Then the total amplitude, because in the denominator here is relatively large, 
uh, the total amplitude is not going to be terribly high. Similarly, when omega is much higher than omega naught, you have the same thing. The total amplitude is not going to be very high. In between, you get some more interesting results. Yeah? Is the webcam on the right, or is that just? I don't know, I don't know what that stupid webcam is doing. Uh, where is it even pointed? Where is it coming from? This thing? Yeah, I'm using, to record, I'm using the, this one over here. So let's just point this away so that you guys aren't disturbed by images of yourselves. That's be safer. Um, yeah, this is this is where I, this is what matters. It's got a wide field of view. I think you can still see me. Okay. All right. So where does this get interesting? Where is the amplitude going to be maximized? It's going to be maximized when this term, this first term here, is zero. So when omega is equal to omega naught, the denominator here is at a minimum. Therefore, the resultant amplitude is going to be at a maximum. So this is going to look something like this. Maybe not exactly like that, but something like that. Um, and we're going to get into what controls the width here in a bit, but let's stick to this, right? So the total amplitude is maximized, of course, when you are forcing your oscillator at its natural frequency. Everything has a natural frequency. When you force things at their natural frequency, <coughs> the amplitude goes crazy. Okay? It is maximized. So uh, when, the, when during the Feynman lectures at Caltech in the 1960s, when he described this to the Physics 1 students, they all decided to test this out. Okay? So they got some speakers. And they set them up to produce a pure tone, and they pointed them at the bottom. They wanted to figure out what the natural tone of the south, the south houses were. And they found it, and supposedly they, they, they stopped before they brought the whole thing down. Because once you hit that natural frequency, the amplitude is go, can go crazy. Okay? So this is what happened um, at Tacoma Narrows. Who's seen the video of Tacoma Narrows? Who has not seen the video of Tacoma Narrows? Oh, you need to see the video of Tacoma Narrows. Okay, we should, we're, we're, we're breaking that out. <laughs> Keep making me change my password. I don't remember where it is. I guess not bad. <laughs> Okay, so this is a bridge that was built in about 1940, um, and it was built across um, I think it's the West from Tacoma. Um, people that want to drive across uh, this particular strand here. And uh, on this particular day, the winds were coming from an unusual direction, and they started inside this weird N equals 2 torsional mode on the, uh, on the bridge. started exciting this mode uh, in the bridge, which was not one that the engineers had anticipated. And you can see why, because it's like, this is not the fundamental mode of the bridge, right? Okay, this is a weird n equals 2 mode of the bridge. Um, but because it was being driven at this particular frequency, the amplitude continued to increase. And you can see the car over there on the left. Um, unfortunately, uh, the guy did leave a dog in his car. 
uh, which is unfortunate. I think it's going to show this. Because let me tell you, the dog did not make it, okay? Just spoiler alert. Um, so of course, over the course of the day, the amplitude continued to increase. Um, yeah, when you see a bridge doing this, you don't want to be involved. So the guy went actually, went, some guy tried to go back out to get the dog, but like, you want to, you want, you want to walk on that? I don't think this does not look. It does not look like a good idea for anybody. Oh, there we go. And you guys are missing a video. I'm gonna take a video of the video. You can just Google YouTube Narrows Bridge Collapse, you'll see it. I don't see him, is he out there? Oh yeah, there he is. Like, oof, he's trying to walk on that. That's crazy. All right, needless to say, it didn't work. Here we go, total collapse. I'm skipping ahead to total collapse, all right. And eventually, um, of course, a torsional bridge cannot achieve infinite amplitude. Uh, and so eventually the whole thing busted apart. And uh, yeah, the car with the dog, unfortunately, went in to the drink and they did not make it. So uh, if you're an engineer, please heed the equation. Do not drive your objects at their natural frequency. So what can you do? To avoid driving something at its natural frequency. <clears throat> at least driving it to the level where it falls apart. Well, I mean, let's look at the equation here. There's a bunch of things you can do. One is to <coughs> minimize the amplitude of the force of frequency. Okay? Okay. So, for instance, the, uh, the ancient Romans knew about this. And the Roman legions would always break stride as they marched across a bridge. Likely because at some point they goose stepped across the bridge all in unison with a very strong force and frequency that was at exactly that level and they, obviously, they must have busted up a bridge at some point because they stopped doing this pretty quickly. So in that case, by not having everyone march in step across the bridge, you're not, you're minimizing the forcing frequency F naught, okay, so you're, or the forcing Amplitude F naught, and you're not driving it as hard. Okay. Where else does this happen? Well, say you're driving along, and your ancient, you know, car starts developing this rattle. Okay. What do you do? Okay. Replace parts on the car. Okay. That's the long-term solution. Um, what's the short-term solution? If you change your velocity. What do you really do? You hit the brake or hit the gas. Come on, don't lie to me. You speed up, okay. So you're gonna speed up, you're gonna naturally try to get out of this frequency where you're, net, where you're driving your rattle exactly at its natural frequency. And you're gonna try to speed up, right? Okay, maybe you can slow down, in theory, but I, I, don't, think that's a, I don't think that's really gonna happen, okay. So you're gonna maybe slow down or speed up. So your, your driving frequency, omega, goes out of the range of the natural frequency of whatever it, whatever that you know pen is you left in the glove compartment of your car, um, and that will reduce its amplitude, and therefore it's not going to make as much noise. What else can you do? You can also increase the friction beta. Okay, so if there's more dissipation within your system, then even when this term is zero, this term will be large enough to, to, to prevent this from going crazy, right? If, for instance, beta equals zero, if you have no friction, then when you're driving it as natural frequency, the amplitude literally goes to infinity, okay? So don't do that. <laughs> have some amount of friction in the system, and the more friction you have, the better off you are. The long-term solution might be to replace the drive shaft, fix, uh, tape down your pen, or whatever, and therefore change its natural frequency, okay? Usually, typically engineers want to tighten things down and move their frequency up outside the range uh, that's being affected.
You can also move the frequency down. That tends to be less useful because like eventually you're still gonna hit it. Okay. If it's down here, you're just gonna hit it 30 miles an hour instead of 60 miles an hour. You really haven't saved anything. Whereas you put it up so that you're hitting it at 120 miles an hour, hopefully that's safe. Um, and that frequency does not correspond to one that you would actually encounter unless you're on the auto block, then it's okay. But if you're here, don't do that. Okay. We're not quite even done talking about the amplitudes though. Um, right, if this maximum comes out at F naught over two beta omega, right? So when this term is zero, you're just taking the square root of four beta squared omega squared, and the maximum comes out here. Okay. Talk about anything else? That doesn't look very interesting. All right, let me skip that part then. Okay, what corresponds to the width of this peak is the next thing we're gonna talk about. So these are different colors, okay, totally different. All right, so the width. The width here, we're going to quantify here as the full width at half maximum. Who's heard of that terminology before? Only Marco. Nobody else has heard of full width at half max? From okay. chemistry. From where? Chemistry. chemistry. Like spectroscopy. Okay. okay. Yeah, near infrared spectroscopy, that's where I first heard of it. Okay, this is, um, I was doing near infrared spectroscopy of the night side of Venus and of the Shoemaker Levy 9 Jupiter impact. When I was but a wee undergrad like you doing, doing undergraduate research, that's what I worked on. And when we looked at um, a bandpass or um, an absorption line, we characterized it based on this. The full width at half max, right? You could also use the half width at half max, or the full width at quarter max or something, right, or whatever. But this is a typical value that we use to characterize the width um, of uh, some Gaussian looking thing like this. Uh, and that full width at half max, the width here is equal to two beta. So the friction, beta, which recall is B over M, the friction controls how wide this peak is. So for instance, if the friction is very high, then you have a very broad, but very, um, not, very not very tall peak, a broad but short peak. Whereas when you have a very small beta, you have a very tight system, that will not create, that won't generate much response at all until you get very close to the frequency. But then when it does, it's going to shoot up and go crazy. And it'll be very high. When discussing um, the full width at half max, um, we really, I don't know, I really don't think of it in terms of beta. Uh, and this is, maybe beta is the smart way to think of it, but. <clears throat> Uh, when it comes to planets or um, other engineering topics, we usually talk about this uh, friction in terms of the quality factor Q. I don't know, calling it quality factor kind of implies a value judgment, I think, that like higher must be better, which is not necessarily the case. But the way we define this quality factor is this is equal to omega naught over two beta. Recall, beta, remember, is B over two M, so that just becomes B over M. So this is essentially one over the amount of friction. Okay? So this is inversely proportional to friction. That's why it's called the quality factor, okay? The less friction you have, the higher the Q, the more friction you have, the lower the Q. It is totally backwards, and it's totally confusing, and I apologize for that, but there's nothing that can be done. Okay. Going back here to um, the full width at half max, uh, because it's inversely, Q and beta are inversely related to one another, if you have a high Q, 
or a high quality factor that leads to a narrow resonance where I'm defining resonance here is when you know when you're forcing an object at near its natural frequency whereas a low quality factor yields a wider and uh, shorter resonance so what Okay, so the way I think of Q is basically the number of oscillations it takes on your object before its amplitude drops by a factor of E. So imagine you hit a bell, dong, eventually it's not going to be making that sound anymore, okay? And the sound is going to decay, it's going to decay exponentially, and how many individual oscillations it goes through before it decays by one over E is roughly the quality factor. Um, it's actually that off by, off by a factor of pi or something. Yeah. So what are Q for a typical object? Um, if you have a pendulum, like that one in the, um, down uh, in the room downstairs over here, AP 122. Do you guys, I guess not all you guys took Phys 211 down there, huh? It's the one with the bowling ball on the, on the, on the string or whatever, right? Gunnar, you didn't see this because we were in like the other, the other building. Yeah, yeah, you missed it. Okay, anyway, uh, it's a bowling ball at the bottom, at the end, at the end of a wire. It's not that interesting. But that kind of a pendulum will have a typical Q of around 100. So it'll go through about 100 oscillations before its amplitude dies down by a factor of Q. For um, a quartz clock, so like a cheap clock in an old cheap wristwatch, has a Q of about 10 to the 4. So once you start that oscillation, it will go 10,000 times before it dies down by a factor of E. When it comes to it, though, where I the reason I care about Q is because planets all have a Q, okay? So if you shake a planet at a given frequency, it's going to respond like the bell that you hit, okay? It's gonna, it's gonna wah, it's gonna wah, wah, wah back and forth. And eventually, that amplitude will die down, but it will take a while. If you do it at like seismic frequencies, like high frequencies, it's gonna die down well, relatively fast, um, but if you, do it at very low frequencies, then the response becomes a tidal response, right? So the Earth responds to being forced by the moon. So as the moon goes around, but actually more as the, as the Earth rotates underneath the moon as it goes around, okay? The Earth is essentially being forced by the tides from the moon with a frequency of actually, twi it's actually twice per day. If you wanna know why, take astrophysics in the spring like complicated, but it's, it's not that bad. But we have a whole, I have a whole lecture on it, so you'll figure it out. Okay, so the moon is pulling the earth back and forth twice per day. The earth today, this is the symbol for earth in astronomy, the, the circle with the plus in it, has a Q that's like what we know colloquially is the technical term is hella low, okay, 12. So if the moon were to disappear tomorrow, the amplitude of the Earth's tide would drop by a factor of E. The amplitude of the tide today is maybe, uh, uh, maybe a meter, between one or two meters, depending on um, whether the solar and, solar, solar and lunar tides are interacting constructively or destructively. But it would go down to only you know, 30 centimeters in about 12 oscillations, which would be six days. So in a week, the tides would still go. If the moon disappeared, okay, they would still go for about a week, but eventually they would bring down. And in, say, four Q cycles, it would be down by a factor of 100, you probably wouldn't notice it anymore. Okay? It would only be a centimeter, right? Because E to the four is 100, you know, pretty close. How do we know this for Earth? Well, there's a couple different ways. One is um, the phase offset, 
between the Earth and the Moon, and we're going to talk about that next as we talk about delta. Okay, but uh, another way is uh, by looking at the rate at which the Moon moves away from the Earth. So the tide, because okay, I'm going to talk about delta. It's time. Okay. If you were forcing something and it responds in exactly the same phase, then delta would be equal to zero, right? Okay, then the forcing and the response would be proportional. And recall that because delta is the inverse tangent of this crazy equation, when is that equal to zero? Tangent is sine over cosine, so it's when sine is equal to zero. When sine equals zero? Pi. Pi or zero. Zero or pi. Okay. So this, therefore, needs to be zero in order for. Uh, if this were zero, then the result will either be zero or pi. Okay. So when is this zero? Omega naught is fixed. So this is zero either when beta is equal to zero. Okay, well that's not so helpful. That means there's no friction at all. Or when omega is equal to zero. Okay, so when you're forcing it at super low frequencies, then the phase offset is zero. What color haven't I used lately? It's too blue. Okay. So if you're going to plot the phase offset, as a function of the forcing frequency, omega, and there's some natural frequency at some point in between, okay? So when you're forcing it at very low frequencies, we've established the phase offset is zero. So at omega equals zero, the phase offset is zero, okay? When this is very large, then this becomes what omega times beta over omega squared. Well, uh, because omega and beta are somewhat related by Q here, ultimately, as omega grows very large, this becomes, um, because the omega is going to, one of these omegas is going to cancel. Okay, When they're big, omega naught is not going to matter. Um, but beta is going to be the same size. Omega will keep growing. Eventually, this will turn to zero again. But it does so at that point, the phase actually is 180 degrees out of phase. So if you're forcing something much faster than it can respond, you end up exactly out of phase with it. Okay? So, oh, kind of funky. I'm looking for a physical pendulum I can use. What can I break? You don't mind if I try it? I, that looks like a good pendulum. Okay, go for it. All right, we're going to use Carlos's keys. All right, so, all right. so I'm going to swing these keys over my head, right? If you swing them, or just sw swing them around in a circle, okay? If you swing them very slowly, duh, they're going to move around with not very much amplitude, but in the same phase as which I'm pushing them, right? Okay. If you move really fast, Note the phase, it's hard to tell, but the amplitude's also tiny, okay? It's not doing much. If you oscillate at its natural frequency, what's the natural frequency? It's about one hertz, okay? So, right, if you want to oscillate at its natural frequency, then you can maximize the, the amplitude. But when you're doing so, imagine you're just going to swing this over your head, okay? When you swing things over your head, in order to maximize, you can feel when the amplitude's being maximized, okay? And you're not exactly in phase with it. You're not exactly out of phase with it. You're exactly 90 degrees out um, of phase, actually. When you're forcing at something 
at exactly its natural frequency. Thank you. I should always bring something around so that I can, uh, to this lecture, so that I can do better than have to look around for something to use. So, the way this looks is eventually it's going to look something like this. When you're forcing an object exactly at its natural frequency, that's when the amplitude is maximized. And you're also forcing it exactly pi over 2, 90 degrees ahead of where it's at, OK? And if you go home and you try this at home and you get a mass on the end of a string, OK, and you try to swing it around your head, you'll very quickly, naturally, figure out exactly how to maximize that um, ultimate um, amplitude. You'll be able to feel when you're 90 degrees ahead and you're pushing that at exactly its optimal frequency. So that's one of your homework problems, is to go home, swing things around. I recommend doing this outside, please, and make sure that your student insurance is all paid up beforehand. It's probably fine. This is not super complicated. But you can really feel exactly when you've maximized that, um, that ultimate um, amplitude. And hopefully, you'll be able to feel it. You'll be able to recognize that you're 90 degrees ahead of the response when you sort of feel like you've maximized um, your effort. And then if you go faster than that, you can go faster than that, you'll end up more nearly out of phase with a lower amplitude. And if you go really slow, you'll be out of phase and you'll be, you'll be closer in um, phase to the exact response. How fast this um, curve moves is actually a function of Q. Higher Q, um, I have plotted in my notes for these values, Q of 17 and then Q of 1.7, in which case it looks more like this. So once again, for higher quality factors, you have to tune it much more tightly in order to maximize um, your ultimate amplitude. When you're forcing it nearly the, the, uh, the exact natural frequency, you're going to have to get much closer for something with less friction. Okay, But when you do, of course, that's when the amplitude goes through the roof and it becomes very high. So this is one of the reasons um, we know what the Q of Earth is, OK? Is you can measure the phase offset between the tides induced by the moon and the moon, where the moon is itself. Who's lived near an ocean? We're all from Idaho, OK? I'm from Missouri, but it doesn't help. All right. Um, the time of high and low tide, high tide, for instance, does not happen when the moon is straight up, OK? Why doesn't it happen when the moon is straight up? Because when the moon is straight up, you're actually forcing Earth at less than its natural frequency. Earth's natural frequency is higher than uh, twice per day, OK? So by figuring out where you are on this curve, we know exactly where we're being we're forcing, the moon is forcing the Earth, OK? And you can actually measure when the high tide occurs. Using these together, you can directly measure the Q of the Earth. Another way to measure the Q of the Earth, uh, so here's the moon, here's the Earth. What's happening is that friction ultimately pulls the tide ahead of the Earth-Moon line, OK? So Earth is spinning fast, faster than the moon goes around. And that natural rotation pulls the tidal bulge ahead. So you should have high tide before the moon goes overhead. And you should have low tide before it, it hits the horizon. <coughs> but if you think about this in an astronomical sense, let's look down. We're looking down on the north pole of the Earth here. The Earth is no longer symmetric. Okay. In fact, this asymmetry to the Earth is going to, the tidal bulge itself is going to receive a pull from the moon. Okay. So the moon's gravity is going to pull that tidal bulge to try to have it be straighter up and down, try to have it be directly beneath the moon. What is that torque going to do to Earth? Earth is spinning this way, by the way. Slow it down. It's going to slow it down. This is going to slow down Earth's rotation. Is that right? Does that really happen? Yes. Uh, if you look back um, three or four hundred million years ago, you can look at uh, sets of what are called rhythmites in the geological record. 
that show one layer per day. And then the size of those layers is sort of modulated over the course of the year as you get more rain, say, in the summer and less rain in the winter. And you find that Earth's rotation used to be 400 rotations per year. Now, Earth's year was not, the, was not any different. There's no reason to think that Earth's orbital period around the sun has changed. However, that mean, meant that Earth's rotation rate was higher in the past. Okay, So if the Earth used to be spinning faster, where did that angular momentum go? Let's look at the other half of this equation. If there's a torque here that the moon is inducing in the bulge by Newton's third law, there must be an equivalent torque on the moon pulling it forward in its orbit from that tidal bulge. Okay? So as you pull the moon forward in its orbit, you're giving it additional angular momentum and energy, and you're causing the moon to spiral outward. Earth's moon is moving outward as a function of time. How do we know this? The Apollo astronauts left little retro reflectors, little cube retro reflectors, uh, at each of the Apollo landing sites. In fact, these are the only Apollo experiments still running. You all spent half a trillion dollars to put seismometers on the moon, and in about 1974, the Nixon administration turned them off so they wouldn't have to pay the scientists to analyze the data. I'm not kidding. This is a very depressing incident. The NASA administrator resigned. It was awful. They couldn't even just not, inter not, not listen, okay? In which case, maybe you could start listening again in the future and do more science on it. No, they sent a command to turn them off, okay? Since then, we don't include off commands, uh, just in case future administrations <laughs> do something crazy like this. Um, uh, but because of that, all the active experiments left at the lunar satellite, uh, the lunar landing sites are all, are all dead. But this passive experiment, where there's just a corner reflector cube, um, still works. And so what happens is they fire lasers at the, at the known landing sites, okay? And you can measure how long it takes for that laser to go out and how long it takes for it to come back. And we've been doing that since 1970, all right? And it turns out the moon is moving out at about two and a half centimeters per year. And knowing this, actually, as we'll get to in astrophysics in the spring, you can also directly calculate Earth's Q from the rate at which the moon is moving outward. And so it becomes this. It turns out most of the dissipation, right? This is caused this low Q means high friction, high B, all right? And so Earth's low Q today mostly derives from dissipation in shallow seas, okay? So when you have shallow seas, you're sloshing the water back and forth through those shallow seas. That's where that dissipation occurs. Um, has anyone heard of the Bay of Fundy in Canada? This is a particular, um, right? North America looks like like this, and there's that St. Lawrence Seaway up over here in Canada before Newfoundland. And this particular bay here happens to be just shaped such that its natural frequency is twice per day. So there's a particular bay in northeastern Canada here where there's a huge tidal amplitude because just within that bay, you're sloshing the water back and forth right at its natural amplitude. And it's places like that that have a particularly high dissipation that drives Earth's very low tidal quality factor. Unfortunately, if you take the rate of recession of the moon and you properly modify it for different frequencies as a function of time and you propagate it backward, you find that the moon would have crashed into Earth three billion years ago. And we know that's not true because we have moon rocks that you can do isotopic dating on that show that the moon is 4.51 billion years old. Very precise. What that means is that Earth's tidal Q has probably not been constant as a function of time, okay? During glacial periods, when you change the configuration of shallow seas, because you put um, a bunch of water on top of North America and Siberia, um, you put two or three kilometers of water, uh, in which case you lower global sea levels about 100 meters. You would have had a different tidal Q, presumably, different mechanisms for dissipation back then. Also, as the continents collide and separate during Pangaea events, you probably have less coastal area and you have less dissipation and therefore a, t a higher tidal Q on Earth as well. So we think that the Q of Earth has probably changed as a function of time, um, but at least to these very interesting effects. Q for other planets, um, Q for like Mars or the moon 
Uh, for planets that don't have an ocean, it's sort of the motion of uh, trying to pull the mantle back and forth and the crust back and forth that provides the dissipation. And so Q for solid planets is about 100. They have less dissipation, higher Q, uh, and therefore um, they tend to have, because these, uh, the, the phase is a function of forcing frequency plot is more peaked. Um, they tend to have less of a, a, a tidal lag angle, and so the tides don't work as well on places like Mars. However, they still work not bad. When you look at what we think the tidal Q is of gas planets like Uranus or Neptune, we think the Q of something like Uranus is like 10 to the 4, because like, okay, there's no water to slosh around. There's no rock to move back and forth. It's just air, right? And it's super, super critical fluid, mostly, if you go down far enough. Uranus and Neptune are mostly made of water, but it's super critical water down its you know, thousands of bars of pressure. So there's no like surface of the water to interact or anything. When you go to giant planets like Jupiter, we think Jupiter's Q is about 10 to the 5, um, which is really high, right? So it's a very high quality factor. Jupiter rings very, in a very high fidelity way and does not ring down. There's not a lot of um, dissipation or friction in the air, right? Because there's nothing happening. There's nothing that can happen. We think stars are probably around 10 to the 6. Um, but the, the constraints we have on this are sort of derived from the tides, and so they're, they're not any direct observations. Um, none of you guys are right now working for Matt Hedman in the department, but something we're starting to realize is that all these assumptions assume that Q is independent of forcing frequency. And that, for instance, if you start pushing something harder, the dissipation doesn't change, which may not always be true. In fact, when we're looking at Saturn, something is deeply wrong in the Saturn system. Like, that place is freaky. Something's going on, okay? In fact, we've actually looked at some of the moons, and it looks like we can actually see them moving outward since Galileo saw them in 1610 which that's not right, or he didn't see, he did not see the Galilean moons, I'm sorry. So it must have been late 1600s, uh, 1700s when those were discovered. Um, whereas the Galilean moons that he did see around Jupiter, we have not seen their periods change. We have not seen them migrate outward at all. Of course, we don't have laser reflector, retro reflectors on them, so the numbers aren't as precise as we'd like, um, but it doesn't seem to do anything frequent, freaky. Saturn is doing some frequency, freaky. Um, but understanding what's going on there is to just you can do it with just treating Saturn, a very complex, interesting planet, like a harmonic oscillator, okay? And looking at the amplitudes that it's generating, the moons beneath it are generating, right? Each of the moons is moving at a slightly different rate as they orbit around Saturn, right? So the forcing frequency for each of those different moons is a little bit different. And looking at how the amplitude and phase offset affects the, planet, the migration, the tidal migrations of those moons, it's telling us something really interesting and almost heretical, which is that it looks like Saturn's moons are not four and a half billion years old like everything else in the solar system. Maybe. This is so crazy, such a crazy idea, we're only starting to like admit that this might be true. I'm, okay, I won't blame anyone else. I'm just starting, slowly starting to admit this is true. Everything else in the solar system was obviously made four and a half, 4.56 billion years ago. If you look at uh, the oldest Earth rocks, they're for uh, 3.5 to 4 billion years old. But before that, Earth was sort of a magma ocean, so you don't expect anything to be sur to survive from the very oldest stuff. If you look at the very oldest meteorites, they're all 4.5 billion years old. <coughs> if you look at the evolution of the sun, as the sun hit its main sequence and it started burning hydrogen and helium, it looks like it's, based on looking at other stars, uh, it looks like it's about four or five billion years old, something like that. All the moons in the solar system we think were formed at the same time as the planets, so everything is 4.5 billion years old, QED, okay. But Saturn's, something weird happened there, okay? So it's, its moons are not, maybe, they might not be four and a half billion years old, in which case some huge cataclysm might, may have happened sometime maybe in the last billion or two years um, that reconfigured that whole system and reformed it into new moons and everything, which is crazy, it's a crazy idea, it's crazy. Probably wrong, can be wrong, right? But everything, every time some new bits of evidence come in, has come in in the last 15 or 20 years, it seems to like support that, which is kind of crazy. Okay, we will continue on Wednesday.
when instead of forcing something with one frequency, we will force them with an infinite number of frequencies in a Fourier series, because, you know, why, why have one when you could have infinite in an infinite number of parts? All right, see you guys then.